an elderly woman went to the doctor's office. When the doctor asked why she was there, the woman replied, I'd like to get some birth control pills. The doctor thought for a moment and said, Excuse me, Mrs. Smith, you're 79 years old. What possible use could you have for birth control pills? She responded, They help me sleep better. They help you sleep better, the doctor inquired. What makes you think that birth controls help you sleep better? She said, you see, I, I live with my daughter, son-in-law, and their six children. I still don't understand, the doctor said. How do birth control pills help you sleep better? That simple, she said. Every morning when she's not looking, I put them in my daughter's orange juice. <laughs> At night, I sleep perfect. <laughs> The woman had a defining purpose for her actions. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a purpose for your actions? Is there a purpose, a meaning, a answer to the why of your existence? There are a lot of competing media philosophies that attempt to answer that question for us. There is the fear factor approach. The purpose is to find that next rush. Or Survivor, the last one on the island wins. Or Star Trek, encouraging us to go where no one has gone before. Or Code Black, the new ER show, which is simply moving from one crisis to the next crisis. Or the beer commercial philosophy, life is a party, go for the gusto. Or Law and Order, it's all about the rules and regulations. And now there's a whole genre of superhero films and TV shows because we all need to be a hero. So, what is the purpose for your life? Jesus was asked the why question along the way in his ministry. It happened one day when a teacher of religious law approached him and said, what is the greatest commandment of all? He was looking for a sense of direction and meaning. He's saying to Jesus, Jesus, if you boil it all down to the bare essentials, if you strip away all of the commentary, what is the most important thing in life? What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? Jesus' answer is specific, clear to the point. He says, here's the most important thing for you to remember. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You are to love your neighbor as you love yourself. On these two commandments, everything else rests. They express the purpose of our lives. So let's look at these in detail. Jesus says, love the Lord your God. Now I'd like to ask you to paint a metal picture in your mind with me. Picture a room in your house. Imagine all of the furnishings that are there. Maybe it's the living room because that's the place where life proceeds from in your home. And as you paint the picture, include two people in the room. You and God. Now I want you to answer some questions. In this picture, how do you and God relate to one, one, no, not one another? Are you intimately connected or is there a distance between you? Do you feel that God is close to you or far away? Do you see God as stern or as smiling? Is God someone that you can warm up to or someone that you need to avoid? Are you afraid of the presence of God? Or do you sense that God has pleasure over you? Why are these questions important? The text says that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Jesus covers everything. The heart was the Hebrew seat of the, the, the soul. It was the Hebrew seat of uh, all of the feelings and passions that we carry with us in life. 
The soul was that place of intention where we make the decisions of our will. The mind was the intellect. The strength was the body. Jesus is covering everything. Everything about us is to love the Lord our God. All of our thoughts, all of our feelings, all of our actions, every ounce of strength we have. Now let me ask you this. Can you love God with that sort of passion if you see God as distancing himself from you? Can you love God if you feel that God is alienated from you? Can you love God in that way if you feel that God is wanting nothing to do with you because of your faults, foibles, and failures? Can you love God like that if you don't believe that God likes, loves, accepts, includes, and adopts you? Now the answer to that rhetorical question is obviously no. You know how impossible it is for us to love anyone who seems to hold us at bay and carry some sort of animosity towards us. Our love for God is not something that is aimed at getting God's favor. Our love for God is not something we do as an obligation to a command. Our love from God is always a response to the love that God has for us. We are taught elsewhere in scripture that we love God because God has first loved us. That's why Jesus spends the bulk of his ministry speaking about the love that God has, the love that God has as father for all of us as his children, the passion that God holds for us. You find it clearly in that most famous of all Bible verses from the New Testament. Probably one of the first ones we learned as little children. God so loved the world. You hear about it when you read the epistles and in the epistle of 1 John we hear the words declare that God is love. The qualities that Jesus paints of God are those of passion, those of love, of kindness, of generosity, of mercy and grace. If we don't catch a glimpse of God's love for us, it will be impossible for us to love God in response. You see, the bottom line is this. Our view of God determines whether or not we feel that we can love God. And so in order to honor this first and greatest of the commands, as Jesus says, we need to feel the embrace of God's grace. We need to understand that Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, is a Father who embraces us, who loves us with a passion, who loves us with his whole being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will never be able to love God and enjoy the blessings of his love until we understand that he really does love us fully and completely as our heavenly father. The second thing Jesus teaches is that we should love ourselves. I know that phrase is not spoken, but it is certainly implied. Jesus says, love others as you love yourself. Before Jesus gets to the ethics of interpersonal relationships, he speaks of the importance of having a healthy self-love, of caring for ourselves, as seeing ourselves as valuable, as important, as creatures with meaning and purpose. Juan Carlos Ortiz is a man that I met several years ago. He was until recently the head of the Hispanic ministries at the Crystal Cathedral out in California. He wrote a book, Living with Jesus Today, and in this book he says, the Holy Spirit talked to me. Don't you know what your problem is, Juan Carlos, he asked me. You haven't accepted yourself as you are. Wait a minute, Carlos injected. How can I accept myself as I am, knowing myself as I do? I can't possibly accept myself. Actually, I'm quite upset with how I'm doing. My character is very poor. I can't accept myself. The Lord seemed to get a little upset with me. 
If the blood of Jesus, my son, is not good enough for me, who are you to say it's not good enough for you? He challenged, are you better than I? I began to see that acceptance has nothing to do with performance. No matter how bad I am, Juan Carlos writes, Jesus is still sufficient. And if God has forgiven me and accepted me as I was, then I should accept myself as I am. Here's the problem. We haven't got that lesson yet. We haven't heard it clearly enough. In fact, even if we have, we need to be reminded of it. God's love for us is not based on performance. God's acceptance of us is based on God's performance for us. It's based on God's grace extended to us. Grace is not something that we earn. It is something that is freely given because God passionately and completely loves us. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. God loves us, period. End of story. Then there's the other part of the equation. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If we receive God's love and respond to God's love, if we realize that we are fully loved and begin to love ourselves, then the byproduct of all of that will be a love for others. We will love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Jesus was once asked by another religious leader the question, who is my neighbor? Do you remember that? Jesus speaks of loving one's neighbor and the religious leader says, okay then, who are you talking about? Just who is this neighbor that I'm supposed to love? You remember how Jesus responded. He told the story of a traveler who was on the way on the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. And as he's traveling, he falls among thieves who beat him and rob everything he has and leave him for dead. And there are some religious folks who come traveling along the way, but they're afraid to connect with this guy. They don't know if he's maybe a thief. They're afraid to uh, be defiled on their way to the temple to worship. So they pass by on the the other side but then there is one who comes by it is a Samaritan a foreigner someone who is outside of the clique of Judaism and he takes this man who's been beaten abused takes him up and carries him to a hotel finds medical treatment for him pays for all of his expenses promises to come back later and check to make sure that the man is okay and Jesus then inquires of the religious leader so who was the neighbor? You see, it's Jesus is turning the tables. The neighbor is the one who acts neighborly. The neighbor is the one who loves the person in need. Jesus is saying that the question is not who am I allowed to love, but we are to be the neighbor who loves everyone whose path we cross. What is life's purpose? When you strip away all of the commentary, when you get rid of all of the excess words, what really matters is that we love the God who loves us, that we love ourselves and appreciate who God has redeemed, and that we love our neighbors as ourself. And yet, there is a little more happening in the text. There's an odd bit of twist. Do you remember the old Maxwell Smart television series? Something would happen, maybe a gun would be fired, and it would barely miss the target. And Max would say, missed it by that much. The religious leader compliments Jesus with a great answer. You've done a great job, Jesus. You are absolutely right. Nothing is more important than loving your neighbor as yourself and loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus looks at him and says, you've missed it by that much. Here's exactly what he said. You are not far from the kingdom of God. I can tell you I've spent most of the time preparing the sermon 
thinking and studying and meditating on this single sentence, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus has been engaging in theological discussion and debates with religious leaders because religious leaders like to do that. We see that the initial part of the text is all about the debates. One of the leaders comes by and sees how well Jesus is doing, holding his own against all of these religious scholars. He always seems to have the right answer to the question, the right words to say. So he asks Jesus one more question. What's the most important of all the commandments? How do our lives find meaning and purpose? And Jesus answers the question. He answers it to the liking of everyone in the crowd, to the liking of the man. There is a dumbfounded hush that falls over all of them at the clarity and simplicity of Jesus' teaching. In fact, after this, the text says no one dared ask him another question. God loves you, he says. You should love God completely, without reservation, without holding anything back. And you should love yourself and others the same way. Everything else rests on these commandments. Well said, the religious leader says. You have answered exactly right. And Jesus says, you're not far. You're not far. Here's the best I can tell what's happening here. It's like when, when you and I hear a sermon or a Bible study or some teacher that gives a lesson or a story or an illustration that really begins to resonate with our spirit. And we say, that's great. And we nod our heads and we smile and we say, what a good word we've heard. Amen. Praise the Lord. We speak in glowing terms about how good God is. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence of it in our daily lifestyle. It's like it's all just lip service. Missed it by that much. A guy stopped by the church this past Monday. Praise the Lord, Pastor, how are you? Let me begin with the praise report, he says. I was just given custody of my three children. God is so good, Pastor, can I give you a hug? And he reached out and gave me a hug. Now what I need, Pastor, is a few dollars so that I can get down the road to work. I'd love to help you out right now, but I have no cash on me, I didn't. And I pointed over at the sign that we have in the window and I said to him, we don't keep any cash in the building. Now, I was about to offer a solution. I was about to invite him to follow me to a gas station. I would put gas in his car. But before I could do that, he started dropping the F-bomb and offered me some sexual advice and counsel. At first, he's saying, praise the Lord and God is good. The next moment, he's dropping the F-bomb. He missed getting what he was looking for by that much. Now, I don't want us to spend so much time worrying about how that man had lost focus and the way he was acting. What I want us to do is ask ourselves. You see... Sometimes we are the ones that are saying amen and praise the Lord and offering a good word. But then we don't surrender to the Spirit. And transformation never actually begins. So today the Holy Spirit is inviting us to more than just words of affirmation. He invites us to express faith, to more fully surrender to his love and grace, to allow that love to wash over us, to wash us clean on the inside and the out, to allow us to learn to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love ourselves and love the world around us in the same way. Maybe, as we remember and participate in this meal, which is a symbol of God's sacrificial love for us, maybe, maybe as we remember this meal and remember Jesus' sacrifice, we will be ready to take that next step. Let us pray.